Thursday's morning program. Partly cloudy tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the upper 50s at the coast to the 70s inland and in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. Sunny, highs from 77 to 85 degrees. That's it for the news tonight on this Thursday, September 18th. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to those of you who called in a pledge. I think we, we probably made that we match. We were able to right. make that $500 match. Thanks to KPFA's apprenticeship program who produced the recorded portions of this broadcast. Kelly Mars is at the controls with Andrea Lewis. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. From Iraq to Gaza, award-winning journalist Robert Fisk reports in a way that is witty, passionate, and subversive. Robert Fisk is releasing his new book of selected essays called The Age of the Warrior at a benefit for the Middle East Children's Alliance on Thursday, September 25th at King Middle School in Berkeley, 1781 Rose Street at 7 p.m. Buy his book and he'll sign it afterwards. And parking is free. For information, go to MeccaForPeace.org or call 510-548-0542. Tickets are available at area bookstores. See you there. Time is one minute after seven, and you're tuned to KPFA, KPFB Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Please stay tuned for Apex Express. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express. Tonight we have a very special show for you on our first day of our fall fun drive. Uh, we interview filmmaker Valerie Carr about her recent documentary film, Divided We Fall, where she examines communities across the country where they've been impacted by hate crimes since September 11, 2001. We also have clips from the film to share with you for the fun drive, as well as the DVD as a thank you gift when you call in for your pledge to, um, of support to KBFA. We are your hosts for the evening, Kim Jin Lee and Renjita Giesler. Please stay tuned. Divided We Fall is the first feature-length documentary film on hate violence following the September 11th, 2001 attacks. And we're going to hear an interview with Apex producer G with the filmmaker about the larger question of the film, Who Counts as American? Let's take a listen. Divided We Fall, Americans in the Aftermath. This is a film that will be showing all across country around the time of September 11th. This film is uh, a feature-length independent documentary about hate violence in the aftermath of 9-11. Filmmaker Valerie Carr and her cousin went on a road trip across the country right after 9-11 to talk to men, women, and children who experienced the violence not seen or heard much in the heat of wartime hysteria and fears. So, Valerie, thanks so much for being on KPFA. It's my pleasure. I um, wanted to start off by asking you, it's uh, been a while uh, since 9-11, and um, what are the things that you most remember about this trip across America where you spoke with um, many of the members of the Muslim, Arab American, uh, South Asian, and Sikh communities? I was 20 years old when I set out across the country, and the journey that I began in the days following the terrorist attacks lasted five years in the making of this film, and it very much shaped my own coming of age. So the stories that I heard while I was on the road um, were not only stories I wanted to share with other people, but stories that really shaped my own understanding of my country and my community. And what I most remember at that time is just how uh, passionately Sikh Americans Muslim Americans, South Asian Americans, wanted to be seen the way that they saw themselves. They saw this country as their home, 
Uh, they saw the sacrifices they made for this country as uh, proof enough that they were patriotic enough without having to wave the American flag. And yet, for the first time, they began to see themselves through the eyes of other people who saw them as un-American, as foreign, as suspect. And some of them, you know, had experienced this before in the Oklahoma City bombings or during the Iran hostage crisis in the first Gulf War. But what happened after September 11th um, happened on a completely different level. The magnitude was just so great that uh, the violence penetrated every area of public life, from schoolyards to public streets to workplaces. Mm -hmm. It really uh, initiated a cultural shift. And for me, as a kid, you know, just figuring out who I was uh, to begin with, um, it was a, a sort of shock to my system to realize that I had to struggle, I had to fight to be seen for how I saw myself. And, and my story is really different because my, my grandfather had come by steamship from Punjab, arrived in California in 1913, so almost 100 years ago. So these questions of, you know, what does it take to prove how American you are? Who counts as American? Is it how long you've been here? Is it how you look? Is it how other people fear you? Is it how you are seen? Um, and so those questions really define the journey that I took in really the last seven years. One of the questions I did have, uh, you talked to so many people who experienced such tragedy and really horrific incidents from being um, beaten or um, in some cases uh, killed. And I wanted to focus on the family of Balbir Singh Sodi, um, who, like you, is of Sikh. American background, um, which is a, a, a religious community, a very large one in, in South Asia, and uh, has been here actually since the early 1900s, coming over as um, farm workers primarily, settling in areas of California like the Central Valley, where you're originally from. And one of the uh, religious, um, uh, I guess, uh, the turbans, when people, men wear that, is a uh, part of uh, the religious uh, belief for some of the men. And Balbir Singh Sodi's family, I believe, they were uh, actually started out their journey in America in not too far from the Berkeley area. This is um, not too far from the city of El Sobrante, and there's a good water there, uh, a religious um, place of worship for the Sikh people there. And uh, that family started out uh, in California and then eventually went to Mesa, Arizona. 9-11 happened, and uh, shortly thereafter... A man came over, uh, drove up to uh, the Sodi's uh, convenience store, I believe, and uh, shot Balbir Singh Sodi and uh, killed him. And you visited the family, you've talked with them. Um, I'm just wondering if you've had any contact with them since then and your impressions about that. Yes, I, I've stayed in very close contact with that family. Uh, again, they, they almost saw me as a, a daughter <laughs> who had come... Um, to grieve with them shortly after uh, Bulgir Singh Sodi was killed and who followed and who kept returning to their home um, every year to find out how the story would unfold. And what I remember and the very, the very first time I met them is I remember the absolute pain, the grief and the suffering of that family who was very, very close who had come here to America to escape religious persecution from India only to have uh, their brother, their father, their uncle killed. And on the one hand, I, I, I remember their suffering. On the other hand, I remember their absolute resilience. The fact that just uh, mere hours after Bobir Singh Sodi was killed, they had the foresight, they had the strength to stand, to hold a press conference and to stand before the hundred camera, cameras um, and and make a statement um, against hate violence and say, we don't want any more innocent people to be killed. In mm -hmm. fact, Bobir Singh Sodi's last journal entry that they found said, Dear God, I am now at a point in my life where I am ready to be used by you in whatever way you want to use me. And the family interpreted that passage, that um, that sentiment that he left for them, to mean that he sacrificed himself so that they would then take up the cause 
against hate violence mm-hmm. to protect even more Sikh people from being killed. So th- the resilience of that family, the way that they were out on the air, uh, airwaves immediately and the way that the story has really been told because of their courage has been just remarkable. I also understand that his brother, uh, who was a taxi driver here in the San Francisco Bay Area, was also uh, shot and killed. Was there any um, resolution to that in terms of, you know, whose killer were and, you know, for what reason? What was so devastating about that murder is that Bobir Singh Sodi's brother was murdered less than a year after his murder in, in the streets of San Francisco. And unfortunately, to this day, there is no evidence. There is no nothing to show why he was killed. Um, all that people know was that he was driving in his taxi cab in the streets of San Francisco when a bullet um, came through the window, uh, entered through the back of his neck. He lost control of the car, and uh, the car crashed, and he was killed instantly. Now, what, what's interesting about this case is that while there is no hard evidence that it was motivated by hate, the family and the larger Sikh community has taken that murder uh as motivated by hate. So it's almost as if it doesn't matter whether one can prove whether something is a hate crime or not, if the family and the community is feeling the ripple effects of being constantly, persistently targeted. And that was Apex producer Jenna Hota, who spoke with the filmmaker Valerie Carr about her first feature-length documentary film, Divided We Fall. As the 7th anniversary of the September 11th attacks recently passed, we've had opportunities to look at how much has changed since the World Trade bombings. Is our world a safer place now than it was then? Uh, We're now going to dive into the question further through the film, and uh, let's go to the film for some excerpts from Divided We Fall. We set out to find the first person apprehended as a suspected terrorist the day after the attacks. Everything was closed on the 11th, so I took the train on the 12th. My friends and uh, relatives would have preferred that I didn't even travel that day. I made a reservation to get on the train the next day, September 12th. And the train was going from Boston to New York. And I remember seeing two men in turbans with beards. While I was waiting for the train, my initial gut reaction was that I was really scared. I noticed exactly where they were when they were walking around the station. Um, I was trying to see if other people were noticing them as well. And so I remember thinking to myself, why don't they just take off their turbans for their own protection? But I probably, it was, prob- it was probably selfishly, you know, for my own comfort as well. Set my foot on the train, I thought nothing can stop me, there's no problem, America is still America. The two gentlemen with the turban sat in front of me. We stopped at Providence, they, they had said something like, you know, ladies and gentlemen, everyone just remains seated, we have a problem with the track or something like that. And everyone's just kind of like, you know, like no one really bought it. I was um, sitting, reading a newspaper and waiting for the train to start again. And actually as we sat there, that's when people just started to strike up conversation. You know, oh, where are you from? What do you do? And like I said, we had firefighters, we had EMT workers, doctors, nurses. 30 to 50 uh, different police officers, uh, CIA officers, and uh, all kinds of law enforcement agents that scarred the platform, got people off the train, and uh, started investigating, questioning. I had no clue, because nobody had come into our coach yet. And then we started seeing, like, SWAT. Two police officers, uh, after having walked through my coach, when came back to me at uh, and at gunpoint, pulled me out of the train. And they just, you know, put your hands up, put your feet in huge, some automatic guns, some handheld guns. Um, and I remember the first thing is, holy, I'm dead. You know, if they shoot, it's going right through. I was asked to keep shot. I was made to hear a lot of profanity. From them. They took him up and they, they took him out of the car and we didn't get to see what happened to them. I was made to feel uh, in those few seconds that as if I had uh, committed some horrific act and I was somehow so closely linked to it. Cher Singh was arrested just because he looked suspicious. 
He was released within hours of his arrest, but his face was broadcast as a suspected terrorist for days. One of the things that's interesting to me is just how quickly people identified those representatives of the enemy, even when they weren't in any way related. And people began to attack those individuals. Hate crimes, oppression, discrimination, the most horrible statements about people who were darker skinned, people who wore turbans, people who resembled the Middle Eastern individuals who were responsible for the violence, apparently. Those people who resembled those enemies became targets. And so we saw incident after incident that indicated that. They were indeed targets. Within the first uh, couple of weeks after September 11th, there were more than a thousand reported incidents of, of hate crimes, um, murders, assaults, uh, people being mowed down with cars, vandalism of mosques and gurdwaras and other places of worship. And I'd never experienced anything like that. You know, wanting to know every day that every member of my family had gone to work and come home okay. You know, it was weird. It was like, why is there a war against my family today? You know, what did we have to do with any of what has happened? Um, but somehow we were, like, involved at this very intimate level, and, and we hadn't done anything. Um, and that's true of my entire community. And so to be a lawyer at that time in this community, when there are very few lawyers, you just... It, I, I ha you felt the need that you had to do something. We were desperate, so I would basically roll out of bed. I had a TV, I had computer, a uh, uh, telephone. I would call people who had, uh, uh, who had reported hate crimes. Um, we'd set up a website the next day. So September 12th, 2001, we set up an online database for people to report hate crimes. September 15th, the Saturday after 9-11, was the first day that most of the six here in the city decided to leave their homes. We had a vigil for the victims in Central Park on the 15th. So a lot of us left the house for the first time on the 15th. Otherwise, people here were scared to leave the house. It was, uh, you know, very depressing. So because we, we knew it would happen, you got a call on, on the 15th, uh, seven o'clock uh, at night, saying there's been a death in in Arizona. And I said, confirmed. He said, yes. So he said confirmed. First, we have some developments in an attack that happened right here. It in involves the valley. a member of the Sikh community. Very well, be the country's first deadly act of misplaced revenge to Tuesday's the attack on America. Shooting immigrated to the U.S. and Phoenix, looking for a better Suspected life. Suspected hate crime right here in the valley. The Mesa gas station owner was gunned down in cold blood by a man who may have targeted him because he was wearing a turban. News of the violence shocked Mesa. Belvier Singh Sodi was well known and well liked in the neighborhood surrounding his convenience store. I'm ashamed that this was the first state to show ignorance and stupidity. We drove long hours through a desert. The desert turned into a city, and there, a gas station. There were still flowers near the Chevron sign where it happened. People were putting the landscape in that day. My brother talking to the landscaping guys. Somebody bring their car behind my brother and shoot five times in the back. He went uh, with us to drop us at the airport. He said, I want to spend more time with my children. And that's the last time I saw him at the airport. So where he's no more. And that's just like a 
terrible moment of my life and I couldn't believe that. One hour before his death, he went to Costco and gave $74 to the New Year victims. Whatever in his pocket, he gave all his money to the New Year victims. One hour before his death, he called me about 2 o'clock and he said, bring me a couple of uh, American flags I want to put on the store. Media people come to me and ask me, what are you feeling about the American? I said, why you ask me this question? Why you not think we are American? Why you put those two words to separate? Because we are American also. I was scared though, but when I heard it, and then I was like freaking out, I'm like, what the heck is going on? The thing that stands out the most to me on that day right after the shootings occurred when me and my wife went down uh, to be with the Sikh community is looking into the faces of the children and to realize what must be going on in their minds. And so together as the Arizona Interfaith Movement, we really are committed to stand against hate and intolerance. During this High Holy Day season for Jews, when we are compelled by our tradition to look within to search our souls and to determine what our future will be. I thought it was important to be with the members of the Sikh community this morning. The guilt by association is not the right thing. Racism is not right. Prejudices are not right. We have to eliminate prejudices. We have to eliminate the hate. We have to bring love, peace and harmony. Being a Christian, I really feel like God will always bring something good out of a tragedy anyway, so. This, this is a condolence letters, just some of the condolence letters to the community and to the family. And this one, it says, a few days ago, I read in horror about what happened to Mr. Sodi. I choked back tears as I read that Mr. Sodi has tried to find a flag to fly at his business. With this letter, I have sent two items which are priceless to me. This flag was used to honor my father at his funeral. He served in the U.S. Army for 21 years. During this time, he worked as a medic in Korea and during two rotations in Vietnam. In my eyes, your father deserves his flags as much as any soldier. He had courage to go to work in spite of the danger imposed by the ignorance of others. He was good and he was kind, and in my opinion, he served our country as faithfully as my father. It's always tough. You can't forget your family member is gone, and life is very tough without. This should not be happening anymore to anybody. Look at uh, my sister-in-law. She, that's, she wants to stay the whole life without him. That's so painful. And that was sound from the powerful film Divided We Fall, which we are featuring tonight on Apex Express as part of our fall fun drive. And it's a very important time to support KPFA and Pacifica. And you can call in your support right now by calling 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732. And I say it's an important time because there is a lot happening out there, locally and abroad, and there's a lot of in intense violence happening around the globe. And we ask you to call in your support of $100 now and receive as a thank you gift this DVD. And as the economy takes a turn for the worse, I'm sure you're all feeling the pinch as we are here as well, and your purse strings are tightening up. All the more reason to call in your support to help keep the important stories on the air like you're hearing this evening, like you hear every week here on Apex Express, uh, brought to you by community members 
like us um, going to you. Uh, now more than ever, the world needs a healthy and vibrant Pacifica and KPFA. So please call in 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732 and receive a copy of the DVD, Divided We Fall, for a pledge of only $100. And as you know, your pledge, your support to KPFA and to Apex Express is critical at this moment. We have a national election coming up in less than two months we uh and every week we share uh perspectives from the asian pacific islander community about not just the elections not just the olympics that recently occurred but about community local community events national events and world events and this is the time to support apex express and kpfa by calling 510 510- Eight four eight five seven three two or one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. And for a pledge of one hundred dollars, you can get your own copy of the film "Divided We Fall," which I'm sure, as you were moved, as you heard the excerpts, as we were moved by the the the, the、um, story of Mr. Sodi and of the Sikh community who、um, suffered tremendously because of their skin, because of their,、uh, you know, seemingly being、uh, considered. Muslim, and you know I'm, st- I'm. I know that we're still all dealing with this today. So please call in now to five one zero eight four eight five seven three two, or one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. And for a pledge of one hundred dollars, you can receive your own copy of this very powerful film, Divided We Fall. And not only have we seen violence increase since the attacks of 9/11 against members of the Sikh community, the Muslim community, we've also seen it here closer to home. And some of you may be concerned about donating to this station at this time. If you've heard about the recent events that unfolded at KPFA with the cops being called in by members of management to remove a longtime programmer and first voice graduate, Nadra Foster, we strongly believe that the cops should not have been called. We also must figure out a way to hold. The culture accountable for the incident, and many people here are doing that on the inside and the outside of KPFA. We also have to move forward and keep things going so that we can create change in the world, cultural change here, and we believe it can be done. KPFA is a resource, a great resource with great potential, and many of us here recognize that we must keep going, and you can. Help us keep going by calling in your support for the good programming that KPFA does, the good people who work here, and for the wonderful resource that KPFA is. So, please call in now at 510-848-5732. You can donate any amount of money, which will help keep us going at this time. 1-800-439-5732. There are many thank you gifts you can choose from, but the greatest, of course, gift that you can get is. The information KPFA provides you daily. Again, the number is five one zero eight four eight five seven three two or one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. And for a pledge of a hundred dollars, you can get this excellent DVD, very informational, very moving. As Rain said, you can get your own copy of the film "Divided We Fall," and、uh, you can get that by calling five one zero eight four eight five seven three two or one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. And every week, you listen to Apex Express, and you hear the stories that you come from the communities that come from international communities, national communities, local communities about the issues that we deal with every day, about the poverty and the violence that we see, and how to rise above, rise beyond. What we have to deal with, and come together in union, and this is an excellent way to do this、um, by supporting KPFA through us. You are contributing to、um, uh, unifying our voice as progressives, as leftists, as Democrats, as. Greens, as whatever you want to call yourself, so please call five one zero eight four eight five seven three two or one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. And as Rain mentioned earlier, it doesn't matter how much you pledge, whether you can afford to give that one hundred dollars for a thank you gift copy of the the wonderful film Divided We Fall, or if you can contribute twenty five dollars and become a subscribing member member to KPFA with full voting rights, we would appreciate and thank every amount that you can donate to.、KPFA. KPFA, and you could do so by calling five one zero eight four eight 
1-800-439-5732 or 1-800-439-5732. But we highly encourage you to call in with a donation of $100 and check it, check out this film, Divided We Fall. It's an amazing, powerful story about how people, um, fall victim to the racism that we all can engage in every day and how we can rise above and learn and teach ourselves you know and check ourselves how we how we can fall into this stuff and how we can rise above it and you can you can check it out for yourself by calling 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732 let's go back to the interview with apex producer g who is spoken with the filmmaker Valerie Carr and this is Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM we're going to go to part two of the interview, we'll be right back these you know, murders right after 9-11 about 19 that have been documented that doesn't include uh, the harassment and uh, other cases of hate, uh, of violence you know, in the, the, the years after 9-11 so what if any, has been um, the upshot of any national dialogue about what it means to be, you know, South Asian or Muslim or somebody who, you know, fits a so-called stereotype of a so-called terrorist. Has there been a beginnings of a national dialogue on this? Because, you know, um, there has in the past with the, uh, around, um, you know, the killing of African Americans. Um, there has been some uh, attempt to develop that through... Um, the killing of uh, that young gay man in, in Laramie, Wyoming. Is this the beginnings of a dialogue to try and, you know, ask the questions about what stereotyping is, what it's been doing to, you know, other people of color in the United States? Unfortunately, there hasn't been the kind of national dialogue around the hate crime murders of Matthew Shepard and James Burr that you saw in the 1990s. Um, and yet, even seven years later, um, we haven't as a country come together to redeem that time to understand what took place and to take a stand as a country against it. That said, you see efforts on the ground here and there by new civil rights organizations like the Sea Coalition, like SOLDEF that have emerged to fight for the rights of these communities. You see um, teachers willing to, to to teach uh, material to their students in ways that they never had before. You see pastors and community leaders begin to take an effort. You see, um, just with the experience of traveling with my film, I have been hosted by the lesbian and gay uh, human rights groups. I've been hosted by um, the Episcopal Church. I've been hosted by... Um, evangelical groups. I've, I've been hosted by groups that would never have come together otherwise that are now beginning to see that the only way they can begin to change the country is by coming together and, and, and building coalitions. Um, and I just want to share my own experience on the road, uh, traveling all across the country through the Midwest and the South. I have began to witness something that completely shocked me. The film would play, and it's mostly stories about Sikh Americans, Muslim Americans, and a gay man would stand up in the audience and say, just as I have to fight for the right of gay people to come out of the closet, so too I have to fight for the right for Sikhs to wear their turbans. I, I would see uh, an African American man stand up in the audience and point to his braids and say, my braids are my turban. And an evangelical Christian stood up in the South and told me, you know, you and I have a lot in common. I, too, have been seen as an outsider. And what I began to realize is that what all of us have in common is that we all want to be seen for how we see ourselves. That whether, you know, we are natives here or we immigrated here that, or whether we were forced to be brought here, that all of us at some point in our ancestral history or in our own lives have been seen as outsiders and that we all have a common stake in this fight to be recognized, to expand that circle of who counts as American, who counts as one of us. And this gives me incredible hope, tremendous hope for the future. Mm -hmm. I know you've um, been taking this film, Divided We Fall, across country to begin this dialogue about uh, race, racism, and uh, what people can do about it uh, in, a, in a wartime, war-minded um, period of American history. 
But uh, in that time, um, are there any other uh, cases or issues that have come up that um, need to have more attention brought to it and just didn't have the time to cover it in your film? Yes. Certainly, um, immediately after 9-11, when I approached Muslim communities about the stories of detention and deportation, many Muslims in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 were too frightened to speak on camera. There was just so much at stake. And what we see, um, what we see uh, what we see after 9-11 is two types of violence. One is uh, the private violence, the citizen against citizen on the ground, and this is mostly what my film covers, but another is public violence, and that's the kind of violence that has been perpetrated by government policies and programs that have targeted Muslim and Arab Americans and non-citizens. And as we see an administration hopefully change hands, we I think these stories, the way that law has been perverted, the way that there have been zones that have been created where human rights no longer exist. Hopefully these stories will begin to come out as we all fight for the soul of our country, the magic of our constitution, and restore what has been lost in the recent years. We're back here on Apex Express. Thank you, Jenna Hota, for uh, your engaging interview with Valerie Carr. And in September, for folks who are interested, Valerie is launching a grassroots discussion dialogue, and it'll be a national tour of Divided We Fall. And this dialogue will cover the politics of fear, hate violence, and profiling post-9-11. And for information and to see where the tour is going, you can visit the website, www.dwf film.com for details and now let's go back to some more footage from the documentary film Divided We Fall. Let's listen. One of the things that happened is after September 11th is that the government sent out the message that it's okay to target immigrants and particularly immigrants who are perceived to be Muslim. It's okay to target those people because that's what we need to do to be safer. But if the government is saying it's okay to do this kind of thing, the next thing you saw was airlines saying it's okay for us to do it too because we're scared too and we want a policy where those people aren't allowed on our planes or employers to say we don't want people like that in our place of business. And it kind of creates this myth, if you will, of saying that certain people are responsible. So it's okay for the government to target them. It's okay for businesses to target them. And then eventually it's okay for individuals to target them. We headed to San Francisco where we met the latest victim of guilt by association. This time, a white Australian. And we were crossing the street towards the bar. We were at... So that intense that we were just outside. Right here. In fact, at this intersection right here. And we were crossing the street towards McDonald's when this guy came, a group of people crossing the road. And they were just a group of uh, white, they're all whites, all dressed very well. Four guys, uh, five guys, four girls. All dressed very well, all, all looked happy, looked like a bunch of friends out having a great night. One member of the group changed the direction that he was walking in so that he intentionally came between Sean and myself and he intentionally rammed into us um, very, very hard. I mean, he knocked, knocked Sean and me um, right out of our way. And then the kids went, walked out here, and then Robert turned around and ran and asked the guy why he did it. His uh, exact words were, because you're a white nigger lover and your friend's an Arabic castle. Those were, that's his answer to why he knocked into us on purpose. One of his friends came in and hit me, and then another one came in at an angle, I couldn't really see him coming in, and uh, he stabbed me. That's where he stabbed me. Uh, I think he used a screwdriver. We got to the hospital, the doctor told us it was a critical or life-threatening injury, and he was in surgery for about two and a half or three hours. So we got very, very, very concerned at that point. In fact, at one point, the doctors came out and told us you have to contact his next of kin. And I was feeling extremely bad, and so somebody was saying, it's not your fault, but... Yeah, it might not have been my fault, but if 
uh, if I hadn't been there, it's very unlikely that this, this whole thing would have happened in the first place. This was not even dangerous skinhead times. This, this was the Abercrombie and Fitch crowd, you know, really. They didn't look at all threatening in any way. We heard about Swarn Buller, a woman who owns a video store in San Diego. We headed south. When I was coming from my place of residence, just on Mira Maror and Cabot, I was in the left lane as usually and I stopped the, my car at a stoplight and I saw two men on my left side drive in a black motorbike. As soon as I stopped my car, you know, they opened my door. The first words were, this is what you get for what you people have done to us and I'm going to slash your throat. As soon as he said that, you know, I, I tried to uh, cover my throat like kind of save my throat and I think that's that was a sentence, a blessing in disguise, you know, because if he had not said that, then he would have gotten my throat. Something like a blade or something like a knife, you know, which I could not see very clearly. So they just cut me off here. I have three cuts here. As soon as they, they had gone, I decided to arrive here for help because I think as long as I get to my store, I'm going to be safe. I, because I was bleeding all over, I might have been bled to death. I could have been dead just in seconds, you know, and not even be here today be talking to you. Soren's case was one of the first cases that I'd worked on, so it was difficult at many levels, you know. And she's someone I had actually known before her attack, so I know what a strong woman she is. And to see her, you know, right after the attack and how shaken she was, it was really hard, you know, to just try to help her through that. I still feel scared about so many things, even at home. Like, even at home, when I'm sitting at home alone, you know, like, I just feel that this somebody walking around or you know somebody might just come in and break into the house or things like that you know and i'm afraid about my my husband or my son you know about my my daughters both of them and uh and the sad part is that i even had an american flag in here i've been we've been selling flags here like you know giving out flags and all that and i had a flag in, even at the back of my car you know Life is too short, I think, you know, and uh, there's they so much hatred in them. They just want to get somebody who's brown. As we navigated different Muslim communities, we met a Muslim boy in San Jose. People have said things to me at school. Like what? Some people say I'm from Afghanistan and I'm Bin Laden's son. And then what do you say? Nothing. Just ignore it. I try to ignore it. My oldest kid who's only eight years old, and he was watching the news with me as he's just crying profusely. And I said, why are you crying? And he says, Dad, I want these people to stop bombing us. And it was, it was a very profound statement coming from an, from an eight-year-old, kind of a gives you an insight into what goes to a child's mind. He's, he doesn't look at him himself as necessarily a Muslim or a Pakistani or, a, or some, somebody of an ethnic background. He, he's an American. All of his friends were uh, uh, putting their lunch pails on my face and kept calling me Bin Laden's son. They kept taking their lunch pails and putting it like that. They start questioning, Am I, do I look any different? Dad, is something wrong with us? Are we criminals? Uh, what is my crime of being born in a Pakistani family? Um, is it a crime to be a Muslim in this country? I mean, those are the questions that go through his mind. He had, I mean, my, my middle daughter, she asked me, I said, Daddy, why are we Muslims? What do you tell him? He saw it in an instant, you know, until then he was an American, and then one moment he became an outsider. I'm not a bad guy, and I don't want to be a bad guy, and, and I want to be a good guy, and I don't want to go to jail. There were two uh, murders that were horrific in and of themselves, but were also looked at together, I think, and um, have been viewed ever since as kind of paradigmatic hate crimes. 
The first was of James Byrd, who was an African-American man in Texas who was dragged to his death by two white individuals. It was an incredibly gruesome killing. The second was of Matthew Shepard, who was an openly gay young man in Laramie, Wyoming, who was beaten and tied to a fence and left to die by his captors just four months after the Byrd killing. And we can contrast that with the, the killings after September 11th. There's a lot that's similar about them, clearly bias motivated. Many of them are very gruesome crimes. And yet, if we look at the type of response that each triggered, I think they're quite different. Matthew Shepard and, and James Byrd, they became synonymous with hate violence. Their names alone became synonymous with hate violence. In contrast, you look at what's happened with Balbir Singh Sodhi, Wakar Hassan, Vasudev Patel, their names aren't synonymous with anything. If anything, they're synonymous with, with terrorists because they sound like terrorist names to an American audience. I don't think that the killings after September 11th led to the kind of sustained discussion about hate crime, hate violence, uh, that the killings of James Byrd and Matthew Shepard did. And then we have to ask why. I think a lot of people saw hate violence after September 11th, whether it was murders or vandalism or, uh, or racist taunts, and said, I don't agree with it. I wouldn't do it myself, but I understand where it's coming from. It's coming from a place of deep anger, a sense that incomprehensible violence has been done to me. September 12th was a day in our history of this country that uh, had probably never happened before. History was in the making, <laughs> at least for me, <laughs> my five minutes of fame. I definitely hadn't really processed what had happened on the train until I had heard about, you know, who these, who these men were. And I had dehumanized him. I didn't want to know about him because I wanted that to all go away. Like, I wanted my prejudice to be right. I didn't want to admit that I was prejudiced. I would apologize for making him not a person in my head for a year and a half. And I see the whole scene again, you know, it is like a repeating a scene every day. Time is a healing factor, like I've been healing every single day. And if, if I think back, you know, I feel that those people who attacked me, you know, uh, I always, I'm, always, I'm always looking out for them. I can't be just coming to work and be scared and coming to work and things like that, you know, I have to be strong. And I think that's what I am now. Because I would have been just, I would, I would be dead, you know, by now. So that is one thing that you know, like uh, I'm, I'm thankful to God that uh, uh, He spared me a life, you know, so that I could enjoy my grandkids and all that. Strange, because when I first talked to you four years ago, you were talking about how everyone called you Bin Laden, and now they're calling you Saddam Hussein. Yeah. When did that change? What, from Bin Laden to Saddam Hussein? Since Saddam Hussein was captured? Then there's this one kid in like fifth grade. But every time he sees me, he would say Saddam Hussein. Yeah, then I went up to him and I punched him. That felt good. Whoa, wait, wait, say it again. You know, one time he just called me that, I punched him. Really? Did you get in trouble? Nobody caught me. Because there's Mexican kids, Italian kids, everyone. So I'm not any different from them. Right? Because there's like a bunch of people who all look different. Welcome back to Apex Express here on KPFA 94.1 FM. We are your hosts for the evening, Kim Jin and Ranjita. And you just heard some excerpts from the documentary film, Divided We Fall, made by first-time filmmaker Valerie Carr. And I'm sure you are just as moved as I was and as Ranjita was um, moved almost to tears, if not to tears. And you can receive your own copy to f to view in private and in its in its entirety by pledging one hundred dollars to KPFA by calling one eight hundred one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two or locally at five one zero eight four eight five seven three two and like I said you can get your own copy of this film for only one hundred dollar donation and when you donate now during our show Apex Express you are 
showing your support for programs that are happening in this time slot, programs that are run primarily through the donated work of unpaid staff, unpaid volunteers. This station survives on the work of unpaid people. Um, there's a lot of paid staff as well who are doing great work, and they're here dedicated. And we have to also acknowledge and honor the unpaid staff who keep this station going through their through their work. And when you do call in at 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732, you are showing your support for not only KPFA, but also all the work that goes on behind the scenes to, to bring you the stories and the news that you find engaging, that you, that has helped your life in some way. Call in your support of, of $100 to get this DVD. Divided We Fall, and there are different ways to pay. You can do electronic funds transfer every month through our secure system, or you can pay uh, in installments. Choose whatever works for your budget right now. Just pick up the phone and call 848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. And we all know and we all see and we all feel what the downturn in the economy is doing. Um, I myself am only working part-time. I can feel it. Yeah, I'm sure you can feel it too. We all have to pinch a little bit more every day than we did the day before. Uh, but we are asking your support for however much you could contribute for programming like Apex Express. So please Please call 1-800-439-5732 or 510-848-5732 and pledge in any amount of support that you can you feel comfortable with, that you feel good about contributing to a progressive station like KPFA. And for $100, you can get your own copy of this amazing film, uh, Divided We Fall, produced by first-time filmmaker Valerie Carr, who herself is Sikh American and traveled throughout the country to document the hate crimes that had um, before fallen Americans of all colors of all races and uh, it's uh, she makes an amazing an analogy of the, the suffering that the Sikh community faced and as you heard in the interview with G as well about the LGBT community and the African American community and how we all need to come together and rise above fear basically it's fear that drives this hate and um, acts of violence KPFA and X Apex Express is the only place that you will be able to hear these perspectives and you can get your own copy of the film Divided We Fall by pledging $100 to KPFA and you can make that pledge to, by calling 1-800-439-5732 or 510-848-5732. And a lot of the incidents that are highlighted in this film shows that these issues move across color lines. When you look at racism or, or violence, acts of violence, they come in many forms and they can come in many places where it could be a progressive institution, could be military, police, and people who are close to you. So I think it's important to um, be educated and to, and to have resources such as this documentary film to highlight these issues, to educate ourselves, to be able to acknowledge when it's happening, to stop it, to hold people accountable for their actions around these acts of violence. And help us to create culture that, that does thrive. How we can be positive and healthy to one another. Create communication. Create safe work environments for one another. Again, you can help us do this by calling 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732. With your donation of $100 to Apex and to KTFA, you will receive your own copy of this great film. I'm sure you are just as moved as I was when you heard the excerpts and the entire film is filled with um, historical information, contextual information, and uh, moving testimony, first-person narratives of uh, people, as you heard through the excerpts, who went through, um, who lived through these hate crimes, who lived through um, these brutal attacks, and um, you know, show absolutely no hate, 
no desire for retribution. All they want to see is、um, people to be able to learn from their experiences, take their negative near-death experience to a more positive one of community building, of revitalizing, of turning that hate into、uh, mutual understanding and love. And it's a very powerful film, and you could view it and you could own it for yourself. You could share it with your loved ones. You could share it with your schoolmates or your your coworkers, your own community,、um, and you can get this copy. Of your own by calling one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two or locally at five one zero eight four eight five seven three two. And this copy of Divided We Fall will be yours for a pledge of only one hundred dollars. Again, that number one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two or eight four eight five seven three two. And I just want to give a couple quick announcements before we wrap up. Just an update on Nadra Foster's case. She will have a court hearing. On September 22nd, she is still facing five misdemeanors, and KPFA has dropped their charges. But the Berkeley City Attorney is pushing all five charges forward, and Media Alliance is currently raising money for Nadra's legal defense. If folks want to get involved, you can contact the Nadra Foster Fund, Care of Media Alliance, at 1904 Franklin Street, Suite 500. Oakland, California 94612, or visit their website at www.mediaalliance.org. And another、uh, announcement for you is that Kearney Street Workshop, or KSW, is the nation's oldest Asian Pacific American multidisciplinary arts organization, and they will present their 10th annual Festival of Emerging Asian Pacific American Artists called Aperture、uh, between September 18th to the 29th. This art festival will take place at venues throughout San Francisco, including Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Intersection for the Arts, and the Manila Town Heritage Foundation. During the 10 days of this festival, events will feature over 80 APA artists through visual art, film, music, comedy, literature, spoken word, and performance. And you could check that out by logging on to www.kearneystreet.org. And that does it for us this evening. We've been your hosts for this edition of Apex, Ranjita Giesler and Kyung Jin Lee. We want to send a special thanks, shout out to our very own Eddie Pei, who is working the board, thanks, hardworking man, and to、uh, G, our regular contributing, hardworking producer. For conducting the interview and always、um, helping out, thank you so much. Before we close out Apex, we're going to go to this with this song off the album Bridge Across the Blue by a featured artist who's going to be at the Aperture event. This is Perini Sundaran Lingham, and again the album is Bridge Across the Blue. Thanks for listening. Ennal in the pase e pesa mudima na thai molly tamalil pesa ve. Tain molly, sizen the nakuhu, mulikatin kithanga. Ningale en elpiku arukuli.
On September 22nd, the legendary Mexican crime fiction writer, political biographer, and activist Paco Ignacio Taibo II will appear in conversation with Donald Nicholson Smith. They'll talk about Taibo's life, work, detective novels, 1968, and a whole lot more. That's Monday, September 22nd at 7 p.m. at the Women's Building, 3543 18th Street, Suite 8 in San Francisco, where tickets will be sold at the door. This event is sponsored by KPFA and is part of a week of events celebrating the year 1968. For more information, go to insurrection68.org. This is KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. It's